Okay, everybody, welcome back. Uh, we're going to take it from the top, but Steve, first, can you give me just a bit of bass drum? Thank you. Okay, Steve, that's great. So, uh, is everybody happy in the studio? Yeah. How much are we paying these people? Good. Okay. Um, right, we're going to run it from the top and make sure this is a good one, lads. We've got the King of Northern Soul coming in, so it's got to be spot what? on. Oh, he's going to love it, he's going to love it. More bass drum, give me more bass drum. Okay, bring the claps in. Loving it, loving it, loving it. Come on. Oh, this is great, great. Oh, hold on, studio, stop. Well, if it isn't the tree lady herself. Well, this is sounding great. What is it? You'll never guess. I'm writing a song for your guest on the podcast today. Who? Pete Walton? Yes, Pete Waterman. It's right up his street. It's going to be a huge uh, hit. But it's not You'll Pete love Waterman. the chorus. It's absolutely huge. What do you mean it's not Pete Waterman? It's Pete Wharton. Definitely? Yes. Oh, God. So what am I going to do with all these musicians then? I don't know. Tell him to go and do musician things. You said Waterman. I didn't. You did. I didn't. You did. I didn't. You did. You said Waterman. And don't think you can bribe me with a cup of tea. So welcome to Pete Wharton from Wharton Natural Infrastructure Consultants. You said Waterman. Stop it. Pete, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Sharon. It's an absolute pleasure to be invited to do this. So tell us a bit about you and how your business began. It began when I was 16, probably, was when I first realised I had a passion for trees. Wanted to go into sports science and realising there weren't any jobs in that. And I went and climbed for an approved contractor, James Tonks, in the village where I grew up. Um, he got me climbing, lugging logs around, and I just saw that as kind of training for rugby. And then I met with the guys at Myersco College, Dalgar O'Callaghan, and he persuaded me and my parents for me to do the degree and to get my A-levels. I suppose my desire was always to run my own business, but how I run my business changes from where it was in 2008 when I set it up to where it is now. So it was 2008 was when the business really began. Yes, that's right. I remember you starting it. But tell us about what services your business provides? So originally it was set up just to do a boricultural consultancy, working primarily with developers. And at the time when we set it up, it was not dissimilar times to now um, in terms of a, a financial crash. So it was three weeks before the last uh, economic downturn was when it was set up. So it was a business of working with people trying to sell backland um, to make some money because actually the, the financial world has just crashed at that point. It's now developed into a more multidisciplinary consultancy, providing a boricultural consultancy, ecology consultancy, landscape architecture and topographical surveys. It's interesting that you've gone to topographical surveys. What a good idea, because they are really variable. And if you're providing that service, you know exactly what the different specialisms need. It was, it was one thing that we've, I think I've heard every ARB consultant complain about that not enough trees have been picked up or they've looked at a site and realized the trees aren't in the right place. Everybody comes up with these problems. So actually just bringing it into the company kind of firstly gave us a bit of leverage with our clients, but also it allowed us to be in full control of it. As you've grown, have you found that the more stuff you get, it almost feels like a different organization altogether? Because I built up a consultancy for someone else from just me to 20 staff, which was a boriculture ecology and landscape. So very similar to yourself, starting at a similar time. To start, it was me. And then I had two other people and I thought, oh, well, why would they work with me? I, I, I expect I'm just going to go the next day. Why would they and what, what's a managing director? Why am I one of those? And then as it grew, you still feel the same person inside. And then you realise you've got this hierarchy of staff and, and some of the junior staff are a bit nervous about speaking to you, which is bonkers. Have you had a similar experience? Absolute mixed emotions. Yeah, I think, I think any person who runs a business will have been through that. And I've spoken to so many people, not just within our industry, but in any industry. And you go through phases of kind of clarity and then getting lost 
and then you grow the business and you think, ah, that, I've got it to that level now. And then your, your ideas suddenly change and you think I've got to go to the next level. Um, and I think one of the, the things of, that I found people who run their own businesses and looking to grow businesses, they have a fairly similar mindset to kind of sports people mm-hmm. is that, that it's kind of relentless. Yes. But there is a downside to that because I think also we don't turn back in the rear facing mirror and say, this is what we've done and what we've achieved. I, I'm really guilty of it that I will celebrate something for about 30 seconds, but I'm looking right. What's the next thing to do? And that, and that can be anything. Like I, I remember um, going to that sports analogy. I remember doing the London marathon for the first time and I was, wasn't doing it for any other reason, but to raise loads of money. And I achieved that. But then I halfway through the training plan, I decided, right, I'm going to run this thing in four hours. I'd never run a marathon in my life. That to me was a reasonable time. And I, and I remember crossing the line in absolute jubilation, tears, everything, that I'd finished the marathon, I'd run the whole way, everything else. And then I looked at my watch and I'd come over the line in four hours and four minutes. And it went from tears of jubilation to absolute, what on earth have you done? You've just messed this whole thing up. And you go from high straight down to low within literally 30 seconds. And I, I remember walking down the mall to my wife and meeting her. And she just looked at me and goes, what's wrong? And I was like, I didn't do it. I didn't get what I wanted. Where do I sign up again? And that's exactly the same mentality in business is that you, you haven't sometimes achieved something and you want to achieve the next thing. When I ran that large company, I felt that growing the business was like a staircase whereby you take this massive step up. Maybe you employ some new staff and you buy some new equipment and then you think, oh, crikey, it's really difficult to manage the invoicing, for example. So then you employ somebody who's going to support that work and then you think, oh, I can't manage my diary. It's total chaos. Then you think, do I get a PA? Don't I get a PA? Blah, blah, blah. So you have these steps up and they feel you feel breathless with the new altitude. And then you kind of coast along for a bit and you think, this is good. This is good. Then somebody leaves or something changes in the marketplace and you have to take the next step up. Um, when I ran this business for someone else, I said, well, we've bought everything now. And he just laughed. He said, you will never finish spending money on your business. You'll never get the IT sorted. And I think that's just common. Is that your experience? Yeah, I think I completely agree. And you, you grew um, your business to, to a greater level than ours at the moment. And it's, it's one of those things, I think you're always trying to strive for the next thing. And I think when you achieve it, I think it's really important to set those personal goals and what does it deliver for you? And I'm, I'm a really firm believer now, and I try and get the whole team um, at Wharton to do that because if you've got a personal goal and an emotional tie to it then actually it makes you want to deliver it but also you've got an achievement at the end of it and that that's critical um, and that, these things that kind of a bit trivial but things such as dreams boards at home like we have one of them because actually the business has to work to allow us to achieve those dreams and we do it here with the guys and I do it at home with my wife and kids as well um, and, it, and it can go from anything. I think the first time we did it, my son's on his dream board was a massive, gigantic bar of chocolate. That's what he wanted. That's an easy dream for me to kind of get rid of um, and try and get him to dream even bigger. But then when you've got things like my daughter wants like horse riding lessons all the time or my wife wants to go to Disneyland, those kind of things, actually they take a bit more structure and a bit more thinking about um, to actually how do you put those steps in that staircase, you, as you've rightly said. To get to that point i think it's so important to have vision i i really echo that and it really focuses the mind this is beyond the scope of the podcast and i make no opinion about what i'm going to say but some people believe it's a kind of manifestation some people call it super manifesting now whether or not listeners agree with that or not or i agree with that or not it is within that practice of actually setting something and then moving on from that and um thinking about how you're going to achieve it. One of the things I really admire about you and your practice, which I I know you, Pete, you know, fairly well, is you have a strong emphasis on togetherness within your business, on almost like we are a family. And I see that you invest time and money on group activities beyond the fee earning. And I, I love that. Tell us about the things that you've done. It's, some, it's something that 
kind of I really love doing and actually this year the whole pandemic has really kind of kiboshed that yeah I know but it but there's always these things of how can we get together can we go for a walk can we all meet up and go and have a picnic somewhere um and in, and I think it's it's been tricky this year no doubt um what it has also done is like we call it being on the bus or off the bus people have made decisions for themselves um within the business so we've had a couple of people get off the bus and we've had more people come on the bus because they can see that where we want to go with it. Um, so I think it, it's really important to me to bring the team together. But also, we, as we were discussing before, I, I'm a relatively young person in charge here. And I don't want to be that person that nobody wants to speak to. I've, I've tried to create a business, which is the business if I could go and find a job again tomorrow, that's the business I'd want to work in. Yep. Um, so it has to therefore be relatively free flowing. There has to be some accountability. But there also has to be reward at the end of it. Reward, not just financially, but also doing other things as well. Almost like developing meaning, you know, people who come into our industries, be it agriculture, ecology, um, they care about what they do. So it's, it's feeling that you're working in something that has great meaning and purpose helps. But also working towards a sort of shared community feel within that company, which actually not everybody's going to fit in. You know, there'll always be some people who it isn't their thing to go down the pub or or to share a meal. One of the things that we did, because Noel actually worked with me where I set up the business before, he would just start cooking meals for people. And it really, really brought people together and the different disciplines together. And we had a laugh. You've got to be able to have a bit of fun with what you're doing. And actually, that's part of it. And I think that the whole COVID stuff is actually, we, I was only discussing it with um, two of our senior consultants this week at their reviews. We feel like the whole issue has brought our team closer together, strangely. The culture has really proven itself through the openness, the honesty, through having a chat with people. And I, I think it's been quite an important learning curve for everybody. I think, uh, particularly with environmental consultancies, because the work that we do is often out on site, um, with ecology, they are difficult hours in the in the summer season. Um, it can feel very fragmented, and you've been very good at ensuring that sort of I call it a family. Um, I don't know if you like that word or not, yeah, but, no, it's, yeah, but that no, sort it's... of family feeling where people can can say how they feel either privately to you or as a group, and uh, actually feel supported by each other. And it's quite hard work to do that. And a lot of workplaces I've, I've worked in, in local authorities, prior to that, I felt very isolated and that I was a weirdo. Yeah, I think, I think we all have that kind of with those tree people or with the, the people who stay up all night looking at bats and what have you. And I think we do have that stigma that we attach to ourselves. And actually, I think it's us who attaches it to ourselves as opposed to anybody else because all we're doing as a company is providing a solution. It just happens that the solution we provide has to be done in the middle of the night in some circumstances. So I, I think that there is a stigma attached to everything that we do. But I also think that actually we've, we're in a really fortunate position that ecology, trees, landscape, anything green has never been more in people's minds than what it is now. Absolutely. And the other advantage to your business model is that clients really like that one-stop shop not only because it's easier for them to actually sort of issue the the mechanics of placing an order, but they feel they develop a relationship with you and that the individual discipline and team members within the different disciplines will work together and there's a much more joined up approach. Yeah, it's it's a more coherent approach to everything. And it, it also means the team can just have those conversations with each other as and when they need to without feeling pressurised that, they're going to phone somebody externally. Is the client going to be charged? Who's going to be charged? Will they have a chat with me or not? So I think there's a huge benefit. And even in projects, for example, where we're not instructed on everything, we'll still put an element so our team can meet together because actually then we can go back with more knowledge and perhaps particularly in landscape, sometimes having more than one opinion isn't a bad thing. The other thing about managing those disciplines was that the income streams and the work streams are very different timing. And so there are, a borough culture tends to be lots of small sections of work that you issue an invoice. Ecology can be longer, the nature of protected species surveys that can go over several months. So the cash flow is different. 
and landscape architecture again has a different time period and and work stream and income stream basis so they don't fit together comfortably i found um i don't know if that's been your experience yeah i completely agree with that to be honest it's quite amusing that yeah that whole analogy is exactly what i was thinking earlier on because we do all of our invoicing at certain times of the month. And I'm always getting on at the landscape architects. Where's the invoices for this work? Why aren't you being hassled? You've got Jack in the background literally being torn from pillar to post that the earth is going to implode if he doesn't get a report out the door. And the landscape architect hasn't started anything for like a month. And he, he kind of thinks to himself, there's just a complete imbalance. But it is that whole thing of very some projects are very quick turnaround projects. Other ones take longer to progress. The nice thing about actually lockdown is that there's been a bit of breathing space. So there's been that element to actually just look and think, right, actually, we've we've got this project in. Let's think about it a bit more than just churning things out. Um, Jack might not agree with that, nor might James, but um, we, I think we have had a bit of breathing space. It, it is tough. It is tough. And what are the difficulties and frustrations that you've had with um, running the business? The number one problem is recruitment by far, and it's every single ARB consultant I speak to has exactly the same problem. I don't know how the arboricultural industry kind of kind of gets its way out of this because we're in a position where we've got lots of very good senior consultants, a number of good consultants and no graduates, and there's no system of actually taking people from graduate through to senior consultants, associate directors, directorship, and allowing them to have a career progression. My one analogy is we're an industry where we have climbers and arboriculturalists going to university, they study a degree and they do their degree and they could then, that should then move them kind of towards going into consultancy or becoming a tree officer, which is again, a vital role job that I did for a few years. It's similar to a bricklayer going and studying architecture and then going back to laying bricks because we seem to go back to this point of I've done a degree now, go and climb trees again. It's incredible, isn't it? That and you're absolutely right. It's a fantastic analogy and a sad one. Hello, this is Tree Lady Talks, and I'm Sharon Durdent Hollenby. All music and production is by Noel Durdent Hollenby, and all views expressed by me or the interviewees are entirely personal. I know that both professional bodies, the Borough Cultural Association and the Institute of Charter Foresters, you know, are providing career pathways, but, but I feel that um, we really have to reach the schools. And I know, again, both organisations are doing that, are influencing the curriculum. And there's an organisation called Teach the Future that Trees and Design Action Group are party to as well. So there are positive things getting through. I personally think that we need a much stronger presence on mainstream media. My children um, are in their mid-twenties now. My eldest is nearly 27. And when he went to university, a lot of his friends were doing forensic science. And I said, how did you learn forensic science? That sounds strange. How did you learn about that? We said, well, all the crime programs on the TV. Well, I say there should be some popularist TV about working with trees and wildlife Beyond Country File, those sort of almost self-selecting programs that those who are already interested in watch, it almost needs to be a character in a soap opera, needs to be a tree officer, you know, something like that. It's something that does need to become more mainstream. It's been interesting. We're, I'm at a slightly different end of the spectrum with children, with a seven-year-old and 11-year-old going on 18, I think she is. We're, we're just choosing secondary schools. And the one thing that caught my eye with this one secondary school is that we did a virtual tour of it with the head, head teacher, like taking us through um, what they come, their culture of the school. And I was, I was amazed. I actually commented to him separately how amazed I was by his culture that he created. It, it, he's running it like a business. But one of the things that stood out to me, he said, oh, we do G GCSEs in architecture. And I'd never heard of a GCSE in architecture. And I thought, all right, so we're getting architecture to mainstream now because it's seen as a design thing, which is fantastic. But now how do we get a boriculture? I still think, I think a boriculture is the biggest hindrance to a boriculture in terms of a word. Yes, actually, we discussed that in an earlier podcast, actually, with um, John Parker. And, and, and it, it is, um, that's why I call myself the tree lady. I literally phone up the client and say, hello, it's Sharon, the tree lady, which is why it's the name of the podcast, because it is a barrier to a lot of people. 
complete barrier and it, it's not my generation that i'm concerned about it's the next generation that are going to take on this mantle and deal with the problems we're creating in a and I, I do i kind of do quite a few presentations but i start with this are we going to be known as the generation that had all the technology and failed environmentally because we were so focused on generating so much money and building so many things that we just ignored what was going on and I, the recent david attenborough series on netflix really kind of highlighted a problem it's on the tip of everybody's tongues, kind of environmental issues. And if we can't do it now for the people after us, then we've, we've done a disservice to them. More than that, history will judge us forever. This is a time right now, we've all got to be vocal about what we do. And it's such a great job. We need many more people studying it, coming out of university working in it in whichever way suits them, to drive better policies, to effect meaningful change that makes a difference to the planet and how people live. That's my rant. Oh, God, that's a bit of a rant. Oh, that was good. Yeah, but it's a positive rant, isn't it? And I think it's, it's about actually making people realise that it is a career path. It's not simply that we're tree huggers anymore. There is a career path. We're reasonable people. We're balanced in our judgment. We understand there's a need for all these different competing factors, but there has to be an element to consider professionally what impact we're having on the environment until we get to that point and actually promote it through schools, through career days, and actually having a podcast with a group of children to see what in their eyes is the environment, because it will be completely different to a 60-year-old. There's, there's a whole host of things. And I, I always ask my son about it, what he thinks like the environment is and what have you. He's only seven, but he just he wants to be outside all the time. You can already see his, uh, his destination's already made for him. I was, I was discussing it today with my business coach. I just said, I've got to get to that point of until we can find out the view, like we always talk about our inner child and we have to go back to what, what would our inner child, my parents are always talking to me about this, like what would your inner child do? And actually I've got to look at it from that eyes because it's not, it's not really me it impacts upon. Last week, we produced a episode on Trees and Design Action Group. And obviously, the essence of that is collaboration. What do you do as a practice to reach out to other professions beyond your own that you provide? So uh, for me, over the past probably 18 months, two years, my, my actual kind of position within the company has completely changed. So technically, I'm not doing a massive amount of arboricultural work because there's far more important work to do to actually go and speak to people like the RTPI and local planning groups. And I spend an awful lot of time speaking with other, other professions to understand what are their pains, what issues are they having, whether it be in the planning system or just generally within the work that they're doing and actually understand, if I can understand what their issues are, then we can try and help and try and find out, well, we're not getting the right people to give us the advice at the right time, for example, would be one of their continued things. Or we've got certain people working with us, but they don't really want to speak to us about projects. They don't want to go and approach the officers to have the discussion. And I think my learnings from being a tree officer particularly was I always like working with consultants who would approach me practically, not simply um, come to me with like, this is what we're going to do. And that you know straight away that it's a last minute approach actually trying to engage with people and I was on a call this afternoon just before this was they've they've asked me to go through the right channels but to go and approach the tree officer about some tree removal I haven't got a problem with that because they're, they're not particularly great trees but it's about that interaction with them because if we get the tree officer on board straight away then we can actually probably between two of us come up with a far better solution where everybody's integrated than actually kind of fighting battles which are unnecessary I've always thought that we're all in it for the same reason we just come at a slightly different approach i agree with you and um it's so great to work with tree officers unfortunately some can't work with you because they're not allowed to i've tried very hard to engage with a local authority recently and it that they said we, we can't we're not allowed to you have to just submit something and we look at it we can't speak to you and i was aghast at that i think the collaborative stuff is so important and it, it's accessible now so people aren't taking hours out of their days to listen to a presentation or have a chat. They're quite happy to turn up for half an hour, three quarter of an hour um, Zoom call or a kind of a presentation or even like podcasts. We spend probably, I don't know, 50% of our time in our cars driving around, listening to aimless radio very often. 
And actually, there's so much learning that you can do in the car. Yes. One of the things that's come out of this pandemic, which is um, terrible as it is, it's been a real bonus in my own consultancy, is the ease of arranging a quick meeting online to discuss a highly technical issue that before would have meant sort of several emails and still some um, not really understanding each other. But now I can go on with some engineers and the clients and some architects and say, this is why you can't do that. So in the TDAG um, episode, I say I'm about to have a meeting with some engineers about some drainage near some trees. I'm sure we'll solve the problem. Well, we haven't yet, but we're going to. And we made enormous bounds in about 20 minutes. Now, that simply wouldn't have happened before. So, so that's really, really helpful. Yeah, I think the it's been interesting. The pandemic literally overnight turned everybody into home working and becoming Zoom experts. And beyond a bit of Zoom fatigue when it first started, because everybody wanted to chat with everybody and kind of keep on keep on going as we normally did, it's become fairly normal. And I think actually what it's also done is make everybody more efficient. Yes, it has. It's costing the client less because they're not paying for 10 people to travel to a site for two hours for a 20 minute meeting. So actually the efficiency is huge. And also it's greener as well, isn't it? Because people aren't either traveling by public transport or driving to meetings that we used to go to. So it's so much better for the environment. I wonder, are there any trends in environmental consultancy? I think people are becoming more aware of what's around them. We're not just working in silos anymore. So I think it's something again that I mentioned in a number of presentations is it's probably the first year ever that people have watched the seasons. So we've watched because we've all been sat at home, either on furlough or working from our bedrooms and what have you, we've watched our gardens go from winter to spring, then spring to summer. We've heard the birds, we've seen the bees, we've seen the butterflies, we've probably seen foxes and various other things in our gardens. And now we've suddenly seen it go to autumn and all the fantastic autumn colour that we get. And I just wonder whether it's opened people's eyes because we haven't been stuck in office blocks. I, I've got the benefit of our office overlooks Coat and Court National Trust. So at the moment, I'm sat looking out the window, looking at some sheep grazing in a field, a few veteran trees. So I've, I, we're in this really lucky kind of environment. But for those people working in cities or kind of where they would normally be working in towns, they might not see any of that because they're either got their back to the window or what have you. Whereas we're probably more comfortable working from home, more productive, and probably slightly more relaxed. Yeah, I think you're right. I think so many people have said just in mainstream media, how they've really appreciated the, the, the immediate green around them. And this is a whole big conversation about how we need to get equity for everybody to have access to green space, whether or not they've got a garden. And that green space needs to be really, really immediate to them. And how important our, our natural world and, and street trees in urban areas are. I'd be interested to find out as well at some point how with the new planning white paper, because they've got they talk about specifically street trees as one of the one of the main key drivers of it. And also biodiversity net gain, that's the other environmental thing that is obviously huge at the moment, which is on, if you go to any planning conference, there will be a section on biodiversity net gain. So somehow ecology has risen really high up the kind of, I suppose, the, the rankings in environmental planning and general town planning. It's how we get arboriculture or trees to fit within that scale. Um, and whether we have to piggyback on the other th on the back of other things or whether we can continue as we're doing, trying to push it as its own entity. This is a situation in the UK whereby our planning system um, is being completely rewritten and out for consultation right now. And one of the things is, that is an objective to have tree lined streets. I'd be really interested to hear from listeners throughout the world about their own system and, and how that helps them with their industry and, and hinders them. Um, I've got some idea from speaking to people um, in different parts of Europe and in Hong Kong, um, but I'd love to hear from you at the Tree Lady 67. What have you learned from other people, Pete, in your business? The first thing is that you can't be everything and you have to relinquish some of the control. And it's about having the team of people around you that can deliver what you want to deliver. Um, so for years, I try to do everything myself. Yeah. And it, just impossible. But I've also learned that I'm, I'm an arboriculturist through and through. I'm not a, I'm a director of a business, but 
I have to do a lot of learning around that because it's a completely different mindset to what I do. Um, so I, I learned a lot and I still keep in touch with probably my first ever kind of consultancy director, Graham Garrett. I have regular phone calls and we, we have a chat every now and again, just about general things. We'll go out on our bikes or um, we'll meet each other at a triathlon or what have you. Randomly, we've got into this same kind of sport um, of doing those kind of things. So I, I learned an awful lot from from Graham. I went and met actually during the during the lockdown um, Rob Oates from Arbtech. He has a completely different philosophy on on life and everything in comparison to me. But he's also done an arboricultural degree. Oh yes. He just happens to run his business in a different way. As I say, I've I've come out of running a multidisciplinary practice to having my own thing, and I wondered which I was. Am I a businesswoman or am I an arboriculturalist? Well, I am an arboriculturalist. So I had to learn those same lessons and realise that. I'm really terrible at some things. You just need to identify your weaknesses and be really honest about those and seek help. Yeah, and I think in where you need to learn, actually take the time to go and learn it. HR is like my my nemesis. I always seem to get pushed into this corner of dealing with HR issues. Yes. And I, and I got to a point last year where I just said, look, I, I've got no interest in it and I, I don't enjoy it. So I'll go and find an expert who's really good at it. And and I think it, it is those time, putting the time and energy into those things that you're good at um, and also knowing what path you're on um, to determine like how you help other people as well. Do you feel a sense of um, social responsibility? I take, well, I take everything quite personally, but it, in terms of when people work here, it's not just the person who I've employed. It's kind of I've got a bit of a duty to that family to make sure they're okay and so we we try and do everything and that's my basis is try and do everything that and if there's one thing I learned from kind of my parents and all that kind of thing was that it's that fairness thing of you deal with everybody how you want to be dealt with and I think if you can get that throughout your company then you're okay and we we kind of we we have a policy at work where we will call each other out for things but it's usually objective we try not to make it a personal thing if we can object it then that's a good thing. It's one of those things. And I think it's then just how you run the company to take it to the level you want to go to and what's your end result. One of the things that really surprised me when I ran the company, I didn't realise that some people just work for the money. And that came to me as a total shock. So during the coronavirus, when people were working at home, in some cases for the first time, how did you take care of the well-being of your staff? Yeah, so the COVID, obviously the pandemic hit and it was a transformation overnight. One of the big issues that we took on fairly fairly early on was actually to furlough some of the team just because we didn't know what was going to come in. But even on the back of furloughing people, there's still an ability to have a conversation with them. Um, and we, fe- we found it really important to actually have two, at least two team meetings a day for the first, I think it was two months. We, it was fairly much definite whether you're on furlough or not on furlough, you could attend these meetings. So it was, it was at your own discretion, but it allowed myself to see where people were mentally, because if they're not engaging with you, then there might be something else wrong. There could be something completely different, but it allows you to kind of get that idea because you understand how those people perhaps function. And when, particularly when we were bringing people back to work and fortunately we were able to bring everybody back. But when we were able to see, I saw one lady's kind of eyes, they just, she just didn't look her normal boy itself in a meeting. There was nothing there. So I then just took a few minutes afterwards just to have a chat with them. And they said they were really struggling because it wasn't that they hadn't got fam, they hadn't got family around them. They were living with their partner, but they were living in a rented house. So they actually couldn't do any work to the house. So they'd done everything. They, they kind of got to that point of they'd done everything. So we, we made the decision to probably bring them back I think it was at least three weeks earlier than what we should have done, simply due to the fact that they needed something to trigger their mind. So we, we just tried our hardest to keep everybody ticking over. I think the other, the other thing that's come out of um, COVID is people's ability to work from home, but also trying to get them to differentiate between home and work again. There's that The balance is, was always we spend loads of time at work and then we have to spend an hour driving home before we finish. And now what it is is that your laptop's in the spare room. So why don't I go and check my emails at 10 o'clock at night? Opposed to just switching off. So I think there's a real, there's still a massive issue of uh, mindset and becoming more strict with ourselves just to kind of park things. What tips do you have for achieving success in building a team? 
I think one of the big things is the ability to listen to people and not think that you're right all of the time. Each person has a very valued uh, idea and input into the direction of a business. So I don't think it should ever be a closed shop. I think it's hiring the right people at the right times and also doing the right jobs where they're best suited. So at the moment, we have a team where we've got James, who particularly in the arboricultural side of things, is very, very good at the veteran tree work and tree risk. And he also likes the development side of it, but his preference is that way. We then got Jack, who's very good at delivery on projects for development, but he will still do tree risk, but his, his preference would be to do development. So I think it's kind of playing to people's strengths and building a team and relinquishing some of the control, allow people visibility of things so they can understand what have they got to do to achieve the goals themselves and what do those goals look like in terms of the business. So have a very fairly clear direction for the business as well. Yes, I think people appreciate um, the combination of strong leadership on, on the ethos of the business, but also the freedom to truly develop their own skills within that framework. And so they, they feel that they are making a difference. I think that's, you know, have some autonomy over their work as well. Um, so it's a very hard balance to strike, but I'm, I'm sure you're striking it. I don't know. You want to speak to the guys. They might not. They might not say the same thing. But I think the, the I think those uh, the boundaries is really important because it's something that I didn't really have. I didn't. I didn't really think they were important. I just thought people came into work and had the same kind of ideas as me. But they really don't. They really don't. No, they really, really don't. And it it takes a while to learn that. Some of the happiest times I had actually was when we were doing things together as a team and. Um, I said to them once, what do you want to do to celebrate the seventh birthday? And they said, we want a children's tea party. So what they wanted to do was have sausage rolls, cheese and pineapple on sticks and jelly and ice cream. And it was in the afternoon and it was really funny. It was brilliant. So you've got to let them come up with the ideas. But no, it is. Um, I think it's really good as well to have some sort of business mentoring. I, I never have, but I think that you and I know that other um, industry leaders such as yourself have also done that. Yeah, I, I do have mentoring because actually it would be wrong of me to say that I could, you can develop a business and suddenly employ how many people and continue to grow a business without any assistance. It would just be kind of like, um, yeah, completely self-defeatist. So I think actually taking the guidance from other experts, again, it goes back to that point of surrounding yourself with the people who, who know what they're doing. Um, and particularly when you're a sole director, it's really quite difficult because you, you've got yourself in a brick wall to bounce ideas off. Noel, when he was in the music industry in the 1980s, um, was in the same building as Pete Waterman, who's a very successful uh, music producer. And he said to Noel, just work out what you're good at and do it. That's all you need to do. So finally, Pete, what's your dream scenario? My dream scenario is really for the environmental world, the environmental consultancies to be around the table when big planning decisions are made, to be actual people who are steering design through the expertise that we have within our industry of how we live, work and play. We have people talking about it continually. We now have to actually take this time and actually influence the decision makers and ensure that it's done correctly. That's absolutely brilliant. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real joy to talk to you. Thank you for your time. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure, Sharon. Well, I didn't think I'd say it at the start, but I was actually really pleased to hear Pete Wharton talking to you today. You two actually have a few things in common, and it was really interesting to hear that he's added topographical services to his consultancy. Oh, I love speaking to Pete and it's so nice when you can get together with other people who's doing the same type of thing because sometimes you can feel quite isolated when you're managing a big practice and you think, is it only me who feels like this? And again, it's just working with others and collaborating and really gives you that support. And he's right about topographical surveys. Most are fine, but if you're providing that service in-house, boy, that's a real asset. Yes, I mean, I remember, and, and I still to a degree have situations with surveyors having problems with topos. So it does make sense that he's done that. It also sounds like he has a very good work ethic and treats staff with a lot of respect. So well done, Pete. Carry on the good work. And thanks for being such a good sport for us in our little play on names game at the top of this show. Oh, we hope you enjoyed that. This is the first day of lockdown two in the UK when we're recording this. And 
we just want to kind of lighten the mood a little bit where we can. So what's happening next week, Sharon? Well, next week we're conducting a number of interviews um, because we've got two big episodes on the go. The first one is with the Woodland Trust, an incredibly diverse charity. We're speaking to many people in the Woodland Trust who are involved with running the organisation and also we hope to speak to some volunteers as well. Um, So that's going to give a really good overview of the good work that they do. So we're working on a global tree health special. We know that people listen in Australia and New Zealand. So if that's you right now, we'd love you to get in touch with us. Okay, well, so what's the best way to get in touch with us? By Twitter, direct message me at the tree lady 67 or by email Sharon at Sharon Hosegood Associates That's a bit of a mouthful. Just Google Tree Lady Talks, you'll find us there. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. We really, really appreciate it. We've had some great feedback this week as well. And you never know, if you're really lucky and anybody wants to hear the rest of that song that I started at the beginning, just ask. I might just do it for you. From the Tree Lady, it's good night. Good night. Do you know what we need, Noel? We need a jingle. Oh dear.